And I was asked to talk about um, what I learned from my experience as being part of this administration and what I took with me from that experience that might inform the next administration or what advice I might have for the next administration. Well, that would take hours. <laughs> but I think what I'll do today is talk about some of the lessons that I learned at the Department of Ed. Um, I was also at the White House. Um, I also was the deputy to the President's Science Advisor, so I did science and technology policy as well as education policy. But I think for these remarks, I'll stick to some education policy. In, if the world of K-12 of, of K is dominated by the three R's, which I have to tell you, whenever I hear that, it makes my stomach turn because um, when I learned how to spell write and, and arithmetic, they didn't start with R's, but that's, you know, that's what we call it. So the three R's of, of K-12 uh, in my life were dominated by the three A's of higher education, accessibility, affordability, and accountability. And so I spent a year of my life um, embedded in accessibility, affordability, and accountability. And I, I want to start by saying, and I've been you know, fairly public <laughs> with uh, both uh, my, my enjoyment of being part of the administration and uh, some of the challenges I've faced, but I want to begin by saying that you know, Secretary Spellings really should be applauded for her interest in higher education, her genuine interest in higher education. She's one of the few secretaries of education who looked carefully at higher education and said, you know, we are at a crucial point in time. We have to really take seriously what's happening in higher ed. And she convened a commission of some very talented and smart individuals to advise her on how it is that we can move forward and ensure that our higher ed system continues to be productive. Now, for full disclosure, I want to tell you I was not part of the commission, and in fact, I was forbidden to ever speak to any of the members of the commission. So I don't really know what happened, what was said behind closed doors. Like you, I only saw the report. But the longer that I spent at the Department of Education, the more convinced I was that my intuition was correct and that the report not only did not reflect the consensus opinion of the majority of the commission, I think that the commission report actually reflected the opinion of just a few individuals. I think there were large numbers of the consortium that were not in full agreement with the final report. And here's why. I think that the report did a phenomenal job of asking some good questions about accessibility, affordability, and accountability. But I think that the condensed time frames that are inherent in political questions and political time frames forced the commission to make some recommendations that were neither well informed nor, well, I, I'll just say it this way. I think they were very short-sighted. So I want to say that I think the commission asked some great questions. I think they came up with the wrong answers. So I want to start talking a little bit about access. So everybody talks about access because based on what we've heard earlier, that is the politically correct thing to talk about. Accessibility, accessibility, accessibility. I, for one, believe that everybody who wants to go to college and has prepared to go to college should have an opportunity to go to college. I was a poor kid. I was a Pell Grant recipient. I was the daughter of a single parent. I grew up in the city of Baltimore. I attended not such a great high school. I'm one of those people for whom higher education made a difference, and therefore I agree and believe that everyone who prepares for and is serious about a higher education should have the opportunity. I don't think that's what we really talk about, though, when we talk about access. When we talk publicly about access, we act as though a college degree is an inalienable right conferred upon all of us by the Constitution of the United States. If we really believe that access is the policy concern, then we had darn well do a better job of funding community colleges. Because folks, the majority of people in higher ed attend community college. Community college provides open access. Anybody who wants to go has a chance to go. And they do it at an enormous value. You get a lot for what you spend at a community college. And how do community colleges stay cost effective? They offer few amenities, and their faculty teach high loads. I was a community college faculty member. It's the best job I ever had. It was not the best paying job I ever had, but it was the best job I ever had. I made a difference in the lives of millions, not millions, thousands of students across my career. Not millions. Um, uh, and, and those students included rich kids, poor kids, black kids, white kids, young kids, 90-year-old kids. All walks of life came into my classroom. 
it was an enormous opportunity. So if we really care about access, then we should do something about community colleges. And folks, I will tell you, I've spent 10 years of my career in Washington trying to advance funding for community colleges to no avail. It's my greatest personal failing. I worked at the National Science Foundation, I worked on the Hill, I worked in the White House, and I came to the department, and every step of the way I said, come on folks, we all love community colleges, we all talk about them, what are we going to do for them? And as it stands, there is one federal funding program in the federal government that is specifically focused on helping community colleges. It's the Advanced Technological Education Program at NSF, and it, re it requires that the money be spent on technician training for the sciences. Great program does nothing for the science and math courses that the majority of K through 8 teachers take as their only higher ed math and science courses. You may not know this, the majority of K through 8 teachers take their only science and math courses at community colleges. We have no programs in the federal government to improve the quality or content of those courses. So I spent a lot of time in Washington saying if we really care about access, pure access, we should do something about community colleges. Well. Politicians love to talk about them, but nobody funds them. Why? There's no political bang for your buck when you fund community colleges. People who go to community colleges are really busy. Most of them are working and raising families and going to school. They're not the people who are out on the campaign trail on your behalf. And even beyond that, community colleges are largely seen as institutions of state and local government. But if we really, really, really care about access, then my recommendation to the Obama administration is, if what you care about is open access, then you need to do something for community colleges, most of which were constructed in the 60s and 70s, and all of which have infrastructure needs in their basic courses. So if we really care about access, you know, I, I think that's where we have to go. I don't actually think that's the real conversation we've had about access. To tell you the truth, I think what we've had is a conversation about access for those kids, which is code for what most people in Washington really care about, which is access by their kids to the college of their choice. Now that's a totally different issue, and we all know that the admissions game is crazy. And while we talk about students who are doing worse and worse, when you look at the most selective colleges, selectivity goes up and up and up. In fact, selectivity is part of the reputation-based ranking system. And the way that you increase your ranking is by becoming more selective. And you become more selective by saying no to more students. I think that's the issue that Secretary Spellings was motivated by. The issue that absent any real information about colleges and universities, people are forced by a reputation-based ranking system to make purchasing decisions about which college their child will attend. Except it's not really an open market, market purchasing decision. And I hate to call higher ed a product or a commodity. And I'll talk in a few minutes about why I do not believe that it is a product or a commodity. But if we're talking about open market systems, you know, it would be as if you said, hmm, Honda, Ford, which one consumer reports ranks as the highest? And then you have to go to the two dealerships and see if they would allow you to buy the car. That's what we have in higher ed. We have a system in higher ed that says, OK, there are all these colleges, and I want to buy a product from this one or that one, but I have to ask them permission to buy their product. And not only does the admission process limit which opportunities you have to select from, and by, I, I was in the gym yesterday watching TV while I was getting dressed, um, which is more polite than watching all the other people getting dressed. And they were giving their report, there was a report released yesterday about the most, uh, the, the best value universities. Number one was UVA, number three was William and Mary. Okay, I don't live in Virginia, but I have lots of friends who do. Every family in Virginia knows that UVA and William and Mary are probably the best value on the planet Earth. How many parents from Northern Virginia can realistically expect their child to get into UVA or William and Mary? So, you know, the silly announcer said, so parents, if you're smart, you'll send your kid to UVA, as though it's your choice as a parent to send your child to UVA. But that's an aside. So, the, the, so the, I think the policy issue that really motivated a lot of the discussion was, you know, you have parents that say, you know, it's $24,000 a year and $50,000 a year here, and I don't know what I'm getting or what the difference is, and oh my God, here's the other part of the equation. 
It's not just the car you buy today that you're deciding. When you pick a college for your child, that's essentially saying your, your child's driving a Pinto for the rest of their life, or your child's driving a Lexus. And we all know this. I went to Salisbury State College. It was a wonderful university. At every job interview I've ever been to in this town, the first question is, why did you go to Salisbury State? Why did you do, why, didn't, why didn't you go to a good college? I'm sorry, it was an excellent college. Oh, and by the way, I was a first-generation college student paying my own way through. <laughs> so what we know about the reputation-based system is that it tells us nothing about what you're actually purchasing other than a reputation. And those of us who are part of the system know that that reputation has a great deal of currency for the rest of your life. And so I think what we're talking about really when we talk about access is you know, parents being allowed to sleep at night for saying to their child, you know what, you got into the state university and the fancy private school and we're only going to pay for the state university. Underlying the public conversation, I really think that's the motivating factor, but you know what, I don't think it's the role of the federal government to make that decision for families. And I don't think there's any way that we're going to be able to inform families to better make that decision. I think they're going to have to make it themselves based on what they know about institutions. And I do think the reputation-based rankings are inefficient and expensive and cause universities to play all kinds of silly games, but I don't know that the federal government can get rid of the swimsuit edition. I just don't think it can happen. So I think that that whole conversation was well intended to try to give consumers more information about the product they're buying, but at the low-income range, people don't really have that choice. Honestly, they don't. And at the high income range, I'm not really worried about whether somebody's going to pick UVA or Princeton or Yale. They're going to be just fine. And for the large masses in between, it doesn't really matter. Because for one reason or another, they probably don't have access to the institution at the top of the rankings. So I think it was a lot of policy making for an issue that concerns a lot of people who live and work in Washington, but perhaps not the greater number of people across the country. So. Here's where I think the larger issue lies with, the, with accessibility. We have created a scenario in which we tell every 18-year-old, if you don't go to college, you're a loser. And we have a country full of 18-year-olds that are neither socially or academically ready to take the plunge. And so college has become the waiting place. You go there because that means your parents are going to keep playing, paying the bill. You go there because that means your parents can continue to carry you on their health insurance. You go there because your parents pray to God every night that once you're there, you'll figure something out. You go there because it beats working a minimum wage job. Oh, and you go there because you got some fancy expensive brochure in the mail that told you how fancy your dorm is going to be, you don't have to share a bathroom anymore, and that you have 18 eating facilities to pick from every night that your parents are paying for, or that the government's paying for, or that you took a loan to pay for. And, and it's Club Med. I mean, you got this gym and you got a climbing wall. We visited one college when my son was looking for colleges. It had a ski resort. The college ran its own ski resort. So you take an 18-year-old, you tell them that you're a loser if you don't go to college, and, and, and you lure them into college with, you know, Club Med, and then you wonder, why aren't they taking it seriously? The one problem I had more than any, well, I had a lot of problems with the commission report, but the greatest problem I had with it is it put no accountability on the part of students. It acted as, it acted as if students were the victims. <laughs> students who come out of K through 12 are unprepared because they're victims of poor systems. I gotta tell you, I did not go to a high school that was known as being an academic powerhouse, and yet there were several of us that did okay. I think you can go to any school and get a great education if you want one. Yes, I had fewer opportunities than my wealthier counterparts who were at boarding school in New England. But I had opportunities when I wanted them. I think all students have opportunities. It's easier for some than others. But this idea that students are a victim of their K-12 education, I think is half-baked. Yes, they may be a victim of their SES circumstance, but there are opportunities to learn at every school. And then the commission sort of went further to say, and once you go to college, which is your right, if you don't make it through, it's because the college failed you. I don't know how many commissioners have taught freshmen anything, but I have <laughs> for 13 years. 
And I have two children who have been freshmen. And so I, and I've been a freshman. And so my problem is that many people who don't make it through the higher education system don't make it because they're not ready or because they're not prepared, or because they're not motivated, or because they went away to college and for the first time in their life they don't have a curfew and they live in a co-ed dorm and there's access to alcohol and, oh my God, who goes to class? <laughs> That's absent from the conversation. And what I hope this administration does, and I've seen some signs that are headed in this direction, I hope this president tells students you have responsibility. You are accountable for your education. So when we talk about accountability, what we really have to emphasize is the student's role in earning their education. It is, that's why I think it's not a commodity. You don't buy an education. You buy the privilege to earn an education. And we have got to make young people understand that it is their responsibility and obligation to earn that education, which means that we can't beat colleges and universities up when retention rates are low and when people either fail or leave. If somebody's not ready and they choose to leave, by golly, we ought to let them go. And so I think we have this perpetual policy struggle. We want everybody to go and we want everybody to succeed and pass and we want the standards to go up. And I'm sorry, that exists in the same world where birthday cake really has no calories. <laughs> And so I think we have to have an honest conversation. If we want greater access, then we have to understand that that means there may be changes in quality and graduation rates and retention rates. And so my policy challenge to the new administration is, let's create some other opportunities for that 18-year-old who looks in the mirror and says, I'm not ready. I'm not ready to make this commitment. I'm not ready to do this. Let's not treat them like the dregs of society. Let's give those kids other options. Service is a good other option. Whether it's the military, AmeriCorps, working in the school down the street, working in the nursing home down the street, I, I don't know. There's no, there's no structure for helping young people mature and explore what it is that they want. So, you know, my policy challenge is let's find other options for the 18-year-olds that aren't ready for college. Let's not give them a $4,000 Pell Grant to go and just, you know, do whatever for a year. Let's give them an alternative so that they can grow up a little and experience the world and figure out what they want to be when they grow up. I think because we don't provide any other options, college has become the waiting place and we waste money. We should make sure kids who are ready can get there and we should provide other options for those who aren't quite ready, including apprenticeships. We've lost apprenticeships in this country. And I will tell you this, I have a kid, one of my kids, got in the 30s on his ACTs. He got a scholarship, he went to college, he came home after a year, he said, Mom, I hate it. I want to be a shipbuilder. I don't want to go to college. I said, okay. So he's learning how to be a shipbuilder. Do you know how hard it is to find apprenticeships? You know, there are insurance, there are liability problems, there's this or that or the other. Well, you know, and then what I hear is, oh, I thought he was a smart kid. <laughs> yeah, he is a smart kid. And you know what? I want my mechanic to be a smart kid. I want my plumber to be a smart kid. I want the guy who built my house to be a smart kid. You know, we have to stop these artificial distinctions that, you know, smart kids go to college, dumb kids go to trades. By the way, the infrastructure around us is crumbling in this country, and part of it's because we pretend like anybody who becomes a craftsman or tradesman is a loser. P.S. They're still making money when many college graduates are in the unemployment line. So that takes me to another concern I have in terms of our policy goals. We as policymakers have sold out higher ed because we have pretended that higher ed is nothing but an economic driver and a job training uh, uh, academy. Now I have been a job trainer. I've worked at a community college where I trained people to be biotech technicians. I think it's a laudable goal. I think it's great to train people to be nurses and doctors and teachers. But I think that we have lost the value of a higher education by telling people that you go to college because your income increases by $1.2 million and because if you go to college, you'll get a good job. There are plenty of people who didn't go to college who have great jobs. 
And there are plenty of people who did go to college who don't have great jobs. I do believe that having a higher education does lift a society, does make a society more human, does make a society more accepting, more helping. It makes us better as a community. And as a result of being a better society, I think we prosper economically. I think we motivate innovation. But I think we sell everybody short when we pretend that you go to college so that you'll make more money and so that you're trained for a job. And in motivating people to go to college for job training, I think what we've done is we've sold our young people out. Because now when we tell them, you should study the classics, they say, why? I'm never going to use that. We say, you should understand higher math. It's beautiful. And they say, I'm not going to be a mathematician. I don't need to know that. And so we have, by focusing on the job training aspect of higher ed, we have lost what makes our higher ed system the best in the world, which is the focus on a real liberal arts education, which in my mind is not train for a career and pick from an a la carte menu three humanities courses. And by the way, we have a couple of fun ones on there so everybody can just fulfill those requirements. We have lost sight, I believe, of what higher education is, which should truly be a liberal arts education. Job training should be extra, in addition to, supplementary to. Supplemental to, sorry. I just, oh my gosh, I've learned this. I've learned about creating new words. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, I think we need, as policymakers, to be clear that higher education and job training may occur in parallel. But higher education is not and should not be job training. We should not motivate kids to go to college because of economic benefits. And I will tell you this. I've told you about one of my sons. I have another one. I have another one who's a senior at, I think, what is the best college in the country. I'm biased. And when I think about the $200,000 that I've spent on that education and the amount of interest I'm going to pay on the parent loans I've taken to enable that to happen, I think if I had invested that $200,000 in an account you know, prior to the economic downturn and let it sit there for his lifetime, it might have accrued enough to have been the $1.2 million that everybody talks about. <laughs> and so I don't justify it because he might make $1.2 million. But I've seen my child become a different human being. I don't question a penny of that $200,000, although I think about it every month when I write the check because it's killing me. Higher ed is about a lot more than what job he's going to get. It's about the way he thinks about himself and his friends and his family and his community and his country and his world. That's the value of higher ed. And when people think in those ways, they are naturally productive. We've got to get away from telling kids you go to college to make more money. And I think we as adults have got to censor what we say. Because when I tell people that my young son is going for a trade, they act like he's dying of cancer. You know, they look the other way and they tell me how sorry they are. And I get emails from my successful friends who say, don't worry, I too was a bike messenger in Washington, D.C. Now, I worry about his safety. He's working as a bike messenger while he's learning boat building. I worry about his safety. I don't, he's making money. He just bought himself a place to live. He's 17 years old. He's doing okay. On the other hand, my other son, who's graduating from what I said before, is the best college in the country. He's 19 years old. He's a college senior. He's applying for PhD programs in philosophy. Worse than the reaction I get when I talk about my trade son is the reaction I get when I tell people, oh, he wants a PhD in philosophy. <laughs> I had a conversation with my son about this when he was home. He said, yeah, 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 mom. You know, everybody's like, yeah, are you going to learn how to tell people, you know, do you want french fries with that hamburger when you're done? <laughs> And this is his response, which is how I know my $200,000 was well spent. Yep, I might end up serving hamburgers and french fries to people when I finish my PhD. But I will serve it with a level of compassion and understanding and curiosity that no other McDonald's employee has ever had. <laughs> and besides, I'll be able to ask if they want french fries in five different languages. <laughs> And it's for that reason that I know I've gotten my money's worth. He may not be a millionaire. He may not ever even have health insurance. But my son has figured out something about living in this world that I, as a 44-year-old, learned from him over Christmas vacation. Thank you.